And firstly, I'd like to thank you very much for the invitation to be here. It's a great pleasure to be here, and I also acknowledge the uh, contribution of the sponsors. Uh, the session, Ross gave me specific instructions in his email. He said, update the data you presented in Montreal. And I've checked with him, the data is going to be released to you in the form of the PowerPoint very quickly, so you don't need to take notes. And it does mirror the data that uh, Professor Jeremy Davey uh, presented yesterday. So <clears throat> without any more ado, because I've got 15 minutes, uh, some home truths. Drivers use drugs for recreational, occupational, medicinal reasons, can be prescription over counter illicit and herbal. Drugs may increase drivers' crash risk, and we've been involved in culpability studies since the 90s. The issues are the crash risk of drugs and their prevalence. Essentially, we, we would love to know the prevalence of drugs in the driving population, and then it would be relatively simple to compare it in the trauma populations, um, but of course, it's very complex. I want to acknowledge the data that, it, that I'm going to present comes firstly from Inspector Borman, Borman from the police and uh, also from Professor Drummer, the Victorian Institute of Forensic Medicine, uh, the institute that does our toxicology. We've been very, very fortunate in that in 1990, uh, Professor Drummer instituted a full toxicology of every driver killed and so throughout the 90s and uh, throughout th this current century, we've had full toxicology for every driver killed uh, in Victoria. So it's given us a good database. We, uh, I'm only going to present the data from 2000 because in the 90s we had cannabis but we were doing an analysis for the carboxy as well as the active ingredient Delta 9 and those, uh, <clears throat> that, those figures were added together. So they, in 1998, we changed and we stopped reporting the carboxy acid. So the figures you're going to see are just purely the active ingredient. Uh, one of the things in the 90s that we did do was the culpability studies, and it's very interesting that... Uh, <clears throat> The first culpability study we did that Drummer released in 1994 showed the cannabis actually had a, uh, a ratio of less than one. And the Herald Sun came out, front page, cannabis, take it because it makes you safe to drive. A and that was a direct, a direct result of measuring the carboxy acid. So once we actually then stopped measuring and reporting the carboxy and only delta-9, the active metabolite, we got quite a different situation in terms of risks. And the two groups that stand up are any alcohol and active THC and stimulants in truck drivers. Uh, I'm going to go on with impairment measures now, the data, um, but before I do, we we consider that uh, there are three groups that use drugs. There's those who are socially irresponsible, there are those who are dependent, and there are also occupational use. The occupational use is of particular interest to us in road safety because we have heavy vehicles being... And, and since we started doing the statistics and looking at heavy vehicles specifically in the 80s, the, the, the statistics have been very, very strong. We've had about 3% of the registration of the heavy vehicles, 10% of the injuries of the heavy vehicles and 20% of the fatalities of the, in, of, of the heavy vehicles. And that, they, they have stayed robust uh, for, for over two decades. <clears throat> we also have significant publications that show that uh, stimulants are used by heavy vehicle drivers and you saw the relative risk of that in that previous slide. We're, go we're going through a very interesting time in Australia at the moment. We're, we're doing a social experiment and we have 
given the powers of the states over to the national authority, the national heavy vehicle regulator. So now we have all the benefits of uniform rules throughout Australia. The truckies can drive from state to state and have the same enforcement rules. But we've, we've uh, as a result of that, there's been two changes. The first change has been uniform enforcement of the rules for prescriptive driving hours, and they have changed the way they count to 12. So now we have a system where with standard hours of 12 driving, you can actually do 14 hours of driving. And with basic fatigue management, which is what you can do with a simple knowledge of fatigue, uh, which allows you 14 hours of driving, you can do 16 hours of driving. And we have an advanced fatigue management program that allows you to do 17 hour shifts and three consecutive 17 hour shifts with seven hour breaks in between. Now, when you see there is significant scientific publication showing that being awake for 17 hours has you at an impairment equivalent to 0.05 BAC, and this is, this is actually working 17 hours. In that 17 hours, they can do 15 hours, 58 minutes driving. So when you put together this interesting social experiment we're doing with uniform uh, rules and the way the rules have been interpreted uh, <clears throat> and implemented, with 20% of the road toll being associated with heavy vehicles uh, and the strong documentation of the use of stimulant drugs by that particular group, I just don't know how you can uh, do 17 hours, three days straight, driving 15 hours plus uh, without some assistance, without some assistance. Um, so that's an interesting space. With impairment measures, uh, I thought, well, I think there would be agreement that uh, a surrogate measure of impairment is drivers killed with a BAC greater than or equal 2.05 BAC. And so we've got the figures there from 2001 to 2013, and we can see that the numbers are going down. We can see that the percentages, uh, that's pretty much similar percentage, so uh, with, with the variations as by year. Another impairment measure is the drivers killed positive to drugs. The numbers, if you, uh, you can look at it one way and think it's level, you can look at it another way and think it's perhaps increasing. When you look at the percentages, you see that uh, there appears to be a definite trend there in the drivers killed positive to drugs. The other group is those who use both substances. The numbers have stayed pretty much the same and the percentages, well, again, it's... Uh, you can debate it. If I put those on the same scale, the red is the top, which is the drugs, the blue is the alcohol, and the bottom is two groups. And if we look at the percentages, I've picked up a Wellington cold. <laughs> so I'm... Uh <coughs> OK. Detection, deterrent and enforcement. We have three types of legislation. Legislation needs to be enforceable, absolutely useless unless the police enforce it. Be resourced adequately by the police, the coronial system and public information and, and we're fortunate in having uh, millions of dollars spent on TV, uh, TV, radio and mass media in, in support of our legislation. And uh, the aim of course is to reduce the crashes. Uh, we have 1949 traditional behavioural impairment legislation, DUI drugs. In 2000, we had the hybrid, which I'm sure you and Jeremy spoke about, uh, and it's similar in every Australian state. <clears throat> the uh, 1994 DUI drugs, we had an inquiry, a parliamentary inquiry that found it wasn't workable 
because the police had to prove that a drug was present and the police did not have the authority to require a body sample for drug analysis and also the science wasn't clear on impairment levels. The second level, the DWI drug impaired drivers, we, uh, Martin set that up and runs it, 150 prosecutions each year, tested for alcohol and if negative, then there is a roadside opinion by the police, there's the behavioural tests and blood is taken and then um, the whole body of evidence is used. Five minutes, okay? So you think I've been going fast? Now I really will go fast. Roadside prevalence, uh, CNS presence, highly overrepresented. With respect to our saliva legislation, three drugs... First year, 13,000, roadside prevalence, uh, publication by Inspector Bullman, uh, when we'd done 100,000, and that shows the relative distribution of the three prescribed drugs. And this one, uh, you really can't see it, but um, <coughs> it's for the purpose of looking at if you're interested in it when you get it in the PowerPoint later on. We've done 275,000 tests, so that's getting up in terms of getting some good figures. And that's a graph of how the number of tests have increased each year. And that's a graph of how the police have improved their uh, targeting or a graph showing that there is an increase in use. I'm not sure which. So... Um, there's an interesting publication there uh, done and it's referenced where we looked at all the drugs that were in the oral fluid positive samples and again, some very interesting drugs. Uh, they are not prescribed at the moment. What's the scorecard? We have over 4 million licensed drivers. We do about 3 to 3.5 three million RBD tests we do um, 11,000 to 50,000 drivers each year. It's increased to 50,000. It's going to 100,000 for saliva. So 50,000 compared to 3.5 million. Um, you've got to be optimistic to think that it's going to uh, have the same effect. And the studies that have been done show in the Victorian situation approximately 50% of drivers tested per year is effective for alcohol. Um, so one of the problems is the high cost of drug driver screening. So there's been a lot of work done in looking at how can we make it cheaper, what technology is available. I've been doing work on that now for four years, looking at different technologies, and the results of that work preliminary is there are low, lower cost screening options, PVT, which is the gold standard psychomotor vigilance test, ocular testing, for instance, ocular and ocular testing, um, pupillometry. Uh, I'm going to finish up by mentioning just one paper that's in the literature, 2014, uh, selective quoting, uh, where this group in Holland looked at all the uh, testing that was available that could be used as a low-cost screen for DWI or saliva, and they found their conclusion, selective quote, preferable tests for initial screening are the PVT. The PVT is the gold standard for vigilance in the field of sleep medicine, has also been studied with various drugs, TH and benzodines, also been used as a fit-for-duty workplace test, very low dollar cost test, $100 on an iPad, and the device software and hardware are very low cost. Other low cost ones are ocular devices, very highly validated, OptAlert, infrared glasses, multiple eye metrics, validated in the scientific literature for drowsiness, also been validated for alcohol, benzenes and caffeine. And finally, pupillometry, which was very exciting in the year 2000, but doesn't seem to have taken off. Uh, I check and the German F2D fit for duty test, both easy to operate, non-invasive and fast tool. There's a lot of publications in the grey literature, 
but there are not many evaluations that are independent um, in high quality scientific journals. Thank you very much for your time.